Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Hala, for that kind introduction. Um, I, I come before you uh, a little more dazed and confused than is usually the case, because I traveled um, 19 or 20 hours yesterday from the other side of the world uh, to come to Portland. So I'm nine hours, my, my body is nine hours ahead of the rest of you. So I'm, I'm really out of it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I also have to give a speech tonight. Um, so what I thought I would do today is to say a few words. I'll talk for, I hope, less than half an hour. Leave uh, as much time as possible for questions. I find that questions are invariably the best part of any good talk. Um, and then leave some time to, to sign some books, because I have to get back and, and try and get myself ready to do this again to an even larger audience than this tonight. Um, which is actually the reason that I came, originally came to Portland to speak to the Unitar Uni Unitarian Universalist Assembly, which is, which is taking place here in Portland. But um, I'm thrilled to see so many people at a conference entitled 40 Years of Occupation, 60 Years of Dispossession. I, I think whoever organized this deserves a round of applause. This is a, an, impressive, an impressive gathering. Um, it's especially impressive at a dispiriting and discouraging time like this. Um, Palestine is in a, a deep crisis. Um, Palestine has been in a deep crisis for 40 years. The title of this event indicates it. In fact, it's been in crisis for 60 years. The title of the event also indicates it. Uh, I think all of you know this. I don't, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. If you know a little more about the history of Palestine, you know that, in fact, Palestine has been in crisis for most of the 20th century and right up till today. Uh, it's one of the things that the book that Hala mentioned, uh, The Iron Cage, uh, tries to explain. Now, I could, I could, if I had the time and the energy, uh, I could lay out for you all the elements of the current crisis. Um, but I think that that really is something that's better done on paper than in a talk. Um, there are some things that you really ought to read rather than listen to. Um, and in fact, I think that some elements of the problems that we see today in Palestine are things that have not changed in their essentials. One of them is a concatenation of external forces, which have put the Palestinians in what I call in my book an iron cage. I originally meant that metaphor to describe the structure that the British shoved the Palestinians into during the mandate, a system where they had to accept a situation in which essentially they didn't exist and another existed before the British would even talk to them. They said, you have to accept the terms of the mandate. The Palestinian leaders would say, but the terms of the mandate don't use the word Palestinian or Arab. It talks about the national rights of the Jewish people, the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. It has six articles talking about how the mandate regime is supposed to do this. It doesn't talk about us. Our political rights, our national rights aren't even mentioned. The British would say, you have to accept the terms of the mandate. Um, and I describe that as an iron cage. Um, the metaphor, in fact, is applicable to other other externally imposed uh, uh, situations that the Palestinians have, have faced since the period uh, of the British mandate. I'm actually not going to talk about that today. Um, I, I think that that's, again, something better read than, than, than listened to. Um, I think, though, that there is something that I do want to talk about, which is also a central element in my book. But I will talk about it in terms of the present r rather than historically. And this is a critical element which I think is hard to talk about, but is some, and many people avoid talking about, and this is the internal element, some of the deep internal problems within the Palestinian national movement. Um, as I try and show in my book, this is in fact an enduring element in Palestinian politics. Um, the inadequacies, the failures, the internal conflicts of the Palestinian national movement in the 30s and the 40s were devastating. Um, it's very easy to blame the British, it's very easy to blame the Arab government, it's very easy to blame the League of Nations. It is possible to talk about American policy until the cows come home and blame the Bush administration, or blame the United Nations, or blame the Europeans, or blame the Arabs, or of course to blame Israel. And this is not to say that those are not all targets worthy of blame. But I think most people in this room know about that. So I'm not going to talk about those things, except in passing. I want to talk about some of the more complicated and, and, and harder to talk about issues, uh, which have to do with Palestinian internal politics. Now, 
Many people who follow Palestinian politics today, uh, in the wake of this devastating fighting that's just taken place in Gaza, have been quick to place blame uh, for the divisions uh, within Palestine uh, on external forces. They have key, they've focused, many of them, not I think incorrectly, on the entirely nefarious role played by leading figures in the Bush administration in encouraging, fomenting, and arming uh, a Palestinian civil war. Uh, that's not wrong, in my view, to focus on that. Um, some people go so far as to talk about this or that Palestinian faction or group as traitors or as stooges and so forth. This, to me, is reminiscent of one of the most destructive and damaging aspects of Palestinian politics back in the 30s and the 40s, when tehwin, calling other people traitors, was common on both sides of Palestinian politics. And it is, I think, probably a mistake. And I'm not going to do that today. Uh, in, what I, in what I will be talking about this evening, uh, in fact, at, at, the, at the Unitarian Universalist Assembly, I'm actually going to focus on the Bush administration. I'm going to focus on their Manichaean vision, on how that Manichaean black and white, good and evil, axis of evil as against whatever, uh, how that has destroyed Iraq, taken Iraq from a, 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 what was a unified country to possibly a country that may not remain unified take a society that was still barely managing to function and shatter it, take the structures and institutions of that society and completely destroy them, uh, leaving the country uh, in a state that is almost indescribable. Um, I will be talking about those things tonight. I'm not going to talk about them today. I will say, however, that that same Manichaean vision, that same obsessive, unfortunately, in some measure, religiously derived vision of good and evil has also driven uh, this administration's policy in Palestine and in Lebanon, and has played a share in pushing both of those societies close to the abyss. Um, I would be the last person to minimize the importance of the role played by our own government in, in all of these crises, whether Iraq or Lebanon or Palestine. But I think I'd be preaching to the converted, frankly, if I talked about that here today. I don't think there's a person in this room who probably voted for George W. Bush. Or if there is, they probably have repented and <laughs> are hiding their heads in shame, even as we speak. Um, this is a man who has the lowest approval ratings of almost any president in modern American history. Um, so it's very easy to, to pile onto the Bush administration. Many, many, many people now who, who, who mistakenly uh, 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 supported the war or supported this administration have, have seen the, 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 the error of their ways and have seen the light. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I think it's more important to focus on the internal problems of Palestine. Uh, if we're going to understand how this very grave situation came to pass, uh, and if uh, you can best understand uh, how you can show solidarity with the Palestinian people. And what I'm going to do is not so much give you history as give you just a little background that I think is relevant to how we got to where we are today. The first thing has to do with sort of evolutionary process that's taken place in Palestinian politics over the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, Palestinian politics have gone through three phases uh, post-48. The first was a phase in which pan-Arab organizations, organizations that were Arab nationalist, organizations that saw that a solution to the problem of Palestine had to be found in a larger framework, tended to dominate Palestinian politics. A group called Harakat al-Qawmi al-Arab, the Arab nationalist movement, uh, and its offshoot, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, dominated that first phase. That was the 50s and into the 60s. Uh, these were people who essentially understood that you could not do anything to change the situation of the Palestinians through mobilizing the Palestinians alone. You had to do it in a larger, uh, essentially, Arab context. And these were the people who dominated Palestinian politics for the first couple of decades uh, after the 1948 war. The second phase was a phase that started in the 60s. And this is a phase dominated by a very different kind of political formation, a group uh, called Harakat Tarur Watani Palestini, the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, which you probably better know by its acronym, reverse acronym, Fatah. Fatah uh, uh, first appeared in the late 50s. It was a 
clandestine organization originally. It came to the surface in 1965. It came to dominate Palestinian politics by the end of the 60s. And the era of Fatah lasted from uh, sometime in the 1960s through the 1990s. Fatah took over the Palestine Liberation Organization, changed Palestinian politics thoroughly. Um, and the only point I would make about Fatah was that it was a broad coalition. Uh, it was a group which argued that the Palestinians had to take the lead in solving their own problems and argued against the pan-Arabist trend that had previously dominated that before the Palestinians can look to other people to show solidarity with them, they had to get their act together. And this was sort of the line of Fatah. So it was a broad coalition and it was a group that sort of talked about the Palestinians solving their own problems first and then you know, going to larger groups to help them. The third phase which we still seem to be into, though I'm not sure. I mean, I'm a historian. I talk about the past. It's very hard for me to talk about how things may go into the future. But where we seem to be today is a third phase in which a third group has, has, has begun to take the lead. And this is essentially a group that grew out of an Islamic trend in Palestine, grew out of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood organization, which is originally an Egyptian party, which had branches all over the Arab world, which have developed independently. And this is the trend that led to the formation in 1987 of a group which we all know now, Hamas, Harakat um, al-Muqawm al-Islamiyya, the Islamic resistance movement. Um, and Hamas has been growing in strength essentially since the late 80s. So the period of the 90s, up to the present seems to be, though I, I'm not sure how long this will necessarily last, a period in which Hamas has dominated. And, and about Hamas, only a few things are necessary to say. The first is that rather than just being a Palestinian nationalist organization, though they were that, uh, and rather than being a pan-Arab organization, they saw things in terms of Islam. They argued Islam is the solution. They argued the, the Palestine question has to be solved within an Islamic framework, and uh, they had a whole analysis that followed from that. So these are the three, this is how we got, as it were, to where we are today, through these different phases. And to say that we went through different phases doesn't mean that any of these things have disappeared. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine still exists, the group that grew out of the first trend. Fatah is still a very powerful organization, it's still there. It still has a, a presence. So to say we've gone through three phases doesn't mean that one thing has replaced another has replaced another. It's simply to say in one period, one trend dominated, in another period, another. And today, a third trend seems to be dominating. That's the first piece of background that we have to have. The second piece of background we have to have, I think, to understand the mess that we're in today is to understand what Oslo was, what the Palestinian Authority is, how it came to be that we have a situation where we are in the 41st year of occupation, and there is something called a Palestinian authority in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, I, was, I was a member of the Palestinian delegation at Madrid uh, and in Washington from uh, October of 1991 until the summer of 1993. And uh, behind our backs, the PLO leadership had begun secret negotiations, which ended up in Oslo, that produced the Oslo Accords. I had absolutely nothing to do with this. We didn't know what they were doing when they did this. We were negotiating on a completely different track in a completely different way to achieve something that I think might have been completely different. Um, but Oslo produced something that was initially intended to be an interim arrangement by insistence of the United States, by insistence of Israel, that there be no discussion of any of the major issues between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Now, you may have thought that there have been negotiations going on since 1991. There have been talks going on. But there have not actually been negotiations about the major issues between Israel and the Palestinians, except once at Camp David in the summer, uh, in the, in the summer of 2000. Everything else that's been discussed, every single thing that was discussed, whether at Madrid, whether at Washington, whether at Oslo, whether at Aqaba, whether at Camp David, everywhere else, in every single session in which Palestinians and Israelis sat down have been interim arrangements. The Palestinian Authority is a product of those negotiations. The Palestinian Authority is not sovereign. It has no jurisdiction. It actually has no authority. And it actually has no control. It was meant to be an interim stage during which negotiation on all the real issues would take place. They never really did. And during which, supposedly, the occupation would be ended, a Palestinian state would be created, and so on and so forth. The, 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 the extraordinary thing about the past, what are we now, 
2007, the past 17 or 16 years, is that in all of that time, there has hardly been any negotiation about the real issues, sovereignty, statehood, end of occupation, settlements, water, refugees, Jerusalem. Those things were off the table. We were not allowed to talk about them in Washington. They were not allowed to talk about them in Oslo. Arafat and his negotiators were not allowed to talk about them in all the negotiations until Camp David, where they were briefly discussed and in the immediately subsequent negotiations that ended up in Taba. But with that brief exception of a few months at the very end of 2000, the year 2000, those things were not, not just not discussed, they weren't allowed to be discussed by an architecture imposed on the Palestinians by the United States and Israel. So what the Palestinian Authority represents is not a state, is not a sovereign body, is not a body that has jurisdiction, authority, control, it is an interim authority essentially intended to manage the situation until a negotiation for the resolution of what are called final status issues, occupation, statehood, sovereignty, refugees, Jerusalem, and so, and so on, could take place. It's very important to understand this, because one of the things that the media makes it look like is that there's some sort of symmetry between an Israeli state and a Palestinian state. There's a Palestinian authority, there's a Palestinian president, there's a Palestinian parliament, there's a Palestinian police force, there's a Palestinian government, they tell us, and on the other side, there's an Israeli this, that, and the other. This is false. This is fundamentally false. The entirety of the West Bank and the entirety of the Gaza Strip are under occupation. They have never ceased to be under occupation. They are the, under the complete and total control of the Israeli military. You cannot enter, you cannot leave. You cannot import, you cannot export. You cannot fly over, you cannot travel by sea or fish without the permission of the Israeli security forces. You cannot register a child, you cannot bury somebody, you cannot do anything of any importance without the approval of the Israeli occupation. This includes Gaza. Even Gaza, from which the Israeli army has withdrawn, from which the Israeli settlers were removed, is still, from the outside, under occupation. It is under the complete, total control of the Israeli military, as is the, Gaza, as is the West Bank, into which the Israeli military carries out regular incursions. So we, we have been given an entirely false, an entirely mistaken impression that there is some kind of symmetry as between two you know, more or less equal parties. Simply not the case. There is a party that occupies, that controls, that is a sovereign state, that has international representation, and so on and so forth. And there is a party that is under occupation and that has absolutely no sovereignty, no jurisdiction, no authority over the territories for which it's nominally responsible, which is to say the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And to understand the fighting, to understand the internal conflict that the Palestinians have been engaged in, you have to understand this. They're operating within this pressure cooker of an occupation. They're not operating in their own stage, in their own state, in their own territory. It belongs to them. I mean, it's not to say it doesn't, it's not theirs, but it is not a territory which they control. And this is the second point that's very important. The third point that's important, and it has to do with the phases that I talked about, is the degree to which, in particular since the death of Yasser Arafat in 2005, but that's only one, one sort of step in this downhill process, since the death of Arafat in 2005, there has been a decline in the ability of Fatah to dominate Palestinian politics. Now, I lived in Beirut for many years. I actually saw this very close up. Fatah was hegemonic in Palestinian politics for decades. They played every kind of game you can think of. They knew how to win elections. And let me tell you something, folks. Winning elections is not some kind of platonic process. I, I lived in Chicago for 17 years. <laughs> and I can tell you things about democratic elections, uh, which would turn those of you whose hair is not white, white. Um, politics is an ugly business. Democratic politics can be an ugly business. And Fatah knew how to play that game, and it knew, knew how to play all kinds of other games. It knew how to play the patronage game, the jobs for the boys game, the Chicago stuff, not things that are that hard to understand. Anybody who knows anything about politics knows what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and th they did it in a manner that was almost effortless for a really long time, from the 60s through the 90s. In fact, they were still doing it, they're still doing it in some respects. But their, their ability to dominate Palestinian politics, their ability to, to achieve their ends has, has declined precipitously. And there are many reasons for that. Um, but it, it has to be said, 
over the last many years of Arafat's life and since his death, it's very, very clear that the capability of Fatah to deliver almost anything has diminished radically. Um, in negotiations with Israel, they proved their utter incompetence. They did a terrible job negotiating at Oslo. Uh, some of you have read Edward Said's critiques of Oslo. Some of you may have read some of my critiques of Oslo. There's a critique of Oslo in my book. Um, I could talk about it in questions if you want. The mistakes that were made there were horrifying. Um, they made terrible mistakes in terms of governance of this miserable, emasculated, bastard authority, which is what the Palestinians emerged from the Oslo process with. There were, even under those very difficult circumstances, under that very low ceiling, there was an opportunity to do something which basically they failed to do. Uh, they failed to establish a rule of law. There was nobody preventing them from establishing a rule of law. It wasn't like the Israeli army came in and said, you can't have a rule of law. It wasn't like you know, Dennis Ross would come in and wave his big finger. That was a Palestinian failure. That wasn't, you know, the United States forced us not to have a rule of law. That was a Palestinian failure. Uh, it's not like that somebody was coming in and telling them, you must take bribes, you must steal. Corruption was not a function of occupation. Corruption was not a function of the Americans dominating the negotiating process. That was a homegrown problem. That was an indigenous problem. And so Fatah, over the last many, many years of its dominance of Palestinian politics, basically has um, lost its ability to, 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 to operate effectively. This contrasted with what Hamas was doing. Hamas was effectively providing social services at a time when Fatah was basically rewarding its cadres uh, uh, sending their kids to, uh, to university abroad, paying for their medical treatment, buying cars, uh, building villas, uh, 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 giving j jobs to people who are politically reliable, uh, and so forth. Uh, Hamas was providing social services for the poorest stratum of people uh, in an in a, in a, in a, in a equitable way and in an effective way. At the same time that Fatah was showing how corrupt they were, how uh, 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 vulnerable to the perks of power, uh, 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 Hamas was showing itself, it, uh, at least it appeared to be, incorruptible. And finally, at a time when, when Fatah was doing, doing a terrible job of negotiating with the Israelis, basically giving away the store, uh, Hamas took a very tough line. Now, when I say this, and when I talk about the fact that, that all of these things led to the election result of January uh, 2006, the Palestine Legislative Council elections that Hamas won, I, I want to stress two things. This doesn't mean that most people who voted for Hamas, the 44% of Palestinian voters in that election, necessarily approved of or even knew anything about, say, the Hamas charter, or Hamas's approach to social affairs, or Hamas's suicide bombings, or a number of other things that Hamas was identified with. They were voting for three, two or three things. First of all, they were voting to throw the bums out. OK? You can understand that. I mean, people are going to throw the Republicans out with any luck simply because they have so grossly mismanaged everything from New Orleans to, to Iraq that anybody would be preferable to most American voters than those people, which doesn't mean people who are Republicans are going to vote against the Republican Party because they've changed their beliefs. No, it's because they don't think these people deserve uh, uh, to be supported. And that's basically one of the things that happened to Fatah. A second thing that happened to Fatah was that people said, you know, these other folks actually have managed to provide social services. They've actually been incorruptible. These guys are as corrupt as the day is long. Let us see if somebody else can give us better governance. This was a, 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 a demand by people living in the impossible conditions of occupation that the circumstances of their lives, which could be controlled by the Palestinian people themselves through this Palestinian authority, be improved. Uh, and finally, I think they wanted a tougher line vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But if you look, by which I mean both in negotiating and in resisting, but if you look carefully at opinion polls in the occupied territories, there was very, very little support, especially towards the end of this horrible suicide campaign, suicide uh, attacks on Israel in, in 2001, 2002, 2003. There was very little support in Palestinian society for that. I don't think that's what people were voting for, the 44% who voted for Hamas. I don't think they were voting for Hamas's very conservative social policies. And I don't think they were voting for uh, 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 the, the charter of Hamas, which talks about the elimination of Israel and has some really nauseating other things in it. 
You should go back and look at it. It's not a document that most people in Hamas pay much attention to. In fact, it's, it's like the old PLO charter used to be. It's much more, much more attention is paid to it by its enemies who are sitting and holding it up and, and making a big fuss about it than, than the people who nominally should be paying attention to it. I don't think most Hamas members even know what's in their charter. Um, so that is what happened in the elections of 2006. Um, and this is where it gets tricky because in 2005, probably sometime after Arafat died, Hamas made a, a fateful decision. And this was a decision after they ran in the uh, uh, municipal elections of that year to run for the first time in an election under the, under the aegis of the Palestinian Authority and to run in the, in the, in the, in the Palestine Legislative Council, Mejit Tashri'i elections of, of January 2006. Um, until this point, Hamas had always said the Palestinian Authority was created by an illegitimate agreement, the Oslo Accords, with Israel. We don't recognize Israel. We don't accept the Oslo Accords. We don't accept the legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority. We will not have anything to do with it. Okay? That was their position. And they didn't run in the elections in which Arafat was elected. They didn't run in the presidential elections in which Abu Mazen was elected in early 2005. Uh, they, didn't run in any, they didn't run for anything under the PA until they finally ran in the municipal elections and won a number of municipalities, essentially for the reasons I've talked about. It had nothing to do with their charter. It had nothing to do with blowing people up. It had to do with, we want somebody who actually pick up the garbage for having stakes and not take all the money and buy BMWs. Perfectly reasonable. Um, and they won a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, city halls in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and so they made this decision. But I, I want you to think about this. Because in agreeing to run for elections for the Palestinian Legislative Council, they were in, accept, in effect accepting the legitimacy of Oslo, of the Palestinian Authority, of the agreements with Israel, and in essence accepting the PLO's position, which had negotiated these agreements, vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Now, they never said that. But that is what running in those elections meant, whether they liked it or not, whether they accepted it or not. And then. To everybody's surprise, including people in the occupied territories, including Hamas itself, international observers, Hamas went and won. They won 44% of the vote as against Fatah's 43% of the vote. But for reasons that have to do with the way the, the districts were divided and the, and the incompetence of Fatah in running its own election campaign, it's the kind of thing that they, in the, in the old days in Beirut, they would never have done. They would not have lost this election. They would have won it one way or another. But they simply hadn't the competence that they used to have. And so for a variety of reasons, a 44 to 43 result turned into a thumping, a huge Hamas majority in the Palestinian Legislative Council. Um, and I think the first question is, even though you can sort of defend Hamas to some extent by saying, well, they had no idea they would win, the question nevertheless is, what were they thinking? You say you are a resistance movement that doesn't accept the legitimacy of Israel. Fine, well and good. You have this charter horrible document. You have been carrying out all these uh, suicide attacks, they, though, though for two years they had completely stopped those. Uh, and you, you denounce the legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority. You denounce the, the process whereby the Oslo Accords were negotiating, and you're running for the, 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 the legislative council that's created under the, under the system? It just does not compute. It's simply, it's simply there's, a, there's a fundamental contradiction there. And now you have won the election, and you have taken over responsibility for governance of the Palestinian people, and you don't accept Israel. The Palestinian Authority is a part of the occupation regime. The Palestinian Authority exists to issue passports and documents to Palestinians who have been vetted by the Israeli security services. It exists to provide the Palestinian side of the Israeli control mechanisms whereby people enter and exit. It exists whereby imports and exports approved by Israel that go through Israel can then go through Palestinian hands. It exists to be the junior partner of the Israeli occupation. That's what the Oslo Accord said. That's what Hamas used to criticize it for. And Hamas took over governance of that Palestinian authority, while at the same time claiming to be pure, to their, to, uh, pure and true to their principles and so on and so forth. What were they thinking? I'm going to come back to this, what were they thinking, when I talk about what has just happened in Gaza, because it gets worse. Um, the, se the second thing that happens as a result of these elections is a thoroughly undemocratic and irresponsible uh, response on the part of Fatah. 
Fatah acted as if it was the natural party of government. Fatah acted as if they had a God-given right to govern. They ignored the, the, the voice of the people. They ignored the fact that they had just resoundingly lost an election. And they refused to accept that you've been beaten, put your tails between your legs, go off in a corner, fix yourselves up, change yourselves, and maybe by the grace of God, you may come back and be digni have, the, have, the, have, the, have the, the right to represent the Palestinian people. They acted as if something had been stolen from them, which was their property, which is the right to govern. And they did not have that right. Their behavior was, and this is not true of every leader of Fatah, it's not true of every cadre of Fatah, it's not true of the entirety of Fatah, but my, my son who was living in Bethlehem uh, said to me the other day on the phone, I remember the day of the elections, the way the Fatah people were behaving. And I said, this is not going to be good. They've just gotten whipped. Christians were voting for Hamas in Bethlehem. All of his neighbors voted for Hamas. They were all Christian. What did this mean? This is people who had always voted for Fatah, and not just Christians, and not just in Bethlehem. And Fatah would not take the lesson, would not take their whipping, would not take the beating that the Palestinian people gave to them, and would not go off and do what a defeated party should do, which is to throw out their own bums, get rid of the incompetents, the, 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 the careerists, the, the opportunists, the thieves, the collaborators, the people who have, have not got the interests of their own people at heart and who have been clogging the arteries of this movement for many, many years. They did not do that, unfortunately. Then there was the reaction of our country and the reaction of the Americans, uh, sorry, the Europeans and the Israelis. I don't need to say anything about this. We all know what the American reaction was. Axis of evil, bunch of terrorists, can't talk to them. Now, in fact, Hamas made a number of moves which if they had been responded to, you might have, and if Fatah had behaved like a civilized political party, you might have been able to, 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 to do something with. But our government steadfastly refused to deal with them, uh, imposed the blockade, which the Europeans in their craven, cowardly foolishness went along with, and uh, the rest, uh, Israel withheld tax revenues, and the rest was history. Uh, when that wasn't enough, as we know, the United States began to foment a civil war among the Palestinians. Some of you have read the report by Alvaro de Soto, the uh, UN mediator. It's available on the web. Uh, uh, there's an article in The Guardian that has a, a, a link to the full report. You can download the 52 pages, confidential, stamped at the top, written by de Soto, and read page by page how he describes American policy as functioning. This is not you know, some rabid, radical critic. This is a, a Peruvian diplomat who's spent his whole career as a professional uh, in the United Nations. And his description is harrowing. He describes the US envoy at one point as saying, I like this violence. He said it twice, I like this violence. I'm happy these Palestinians are doing this. This is a direct quote. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the DeSoto report. That was the policy of our government. Um, finally, for a variety of reasons, we have had a civil war. Um, for many, many months, I kept saying to myself, I really hope it won't come to this. Uh, I would get asked the question on the radio or, or, or television or by jur other journalists, and I would say, they would say, is there going to be, is there a civil war? I said, well, not yet. I hope not. I, I don't know. But we have had a civil war. This is what has just happened. I mean, it's not, it's not been finalized, but that is what we have had. Um, and I would say this is as bad as anything uh, that's happened in Palestinian politics for almost the past 70 years. Uh, uh, you can blame uh, the, f the, 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 the policies of the United States, of Europe, and Israel for much of this. Uh, I think as American citizens, it is our, 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 our duty to focus on this. Um, but as people who are interested in the truth and people who are interested in justice in Palestine, I think we have to be more critical than, than just to say, you know, Elliot Abrams and David Welch and the president and Cheney and they're all responsible or the Israelis or whatever. I think we have to go a little deeper than that. Um, and I think that the behavior of both Palestinian political parties, both movements, was irresponsible and foolish to the point of criminal. Uh, I think both of them, allowing themselves to be dragged into a civil war for whatever reason, with whatever provocation, with whatever support they were getting from the outside, is unpardonable. And I don't just think this myself. If, if you look at what Palestinians are saying about both parties, they're saying a pox on both your houses. I think that neither of these groups would get half the votes that they got in, uh, in 2006, were there to be a referendum today. I doubt they would have 20% each. I doubt they would have e even that much. Most Palestinians are revolted 
by their behavior. Absolutely revolted, and, and rightly so. Um, clearly, in the disadvantageous situation that the Palestinian people find themselves, the absolute minimum is some modicum of unity. I mean, unity by itself is not going to be enough for them to end the occupation and achieve some form of liberation and, 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 and solve all the problems the Palestinians face. But you can't do anything without that. And these two parties, in their irresponsible foolishness, uh, have, have shattered that. Um, I could talk about where this leaves us, about the division of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, about how bad that is. Uh, I could talk about what I think we could or should do, but I, I, I don't find it's my job to tell people what they should do. I think you decide what you want to do yourselves. It's my job to tell you what I know about the situation. Uh, the only thing that I would, I would end with um, is that it's important not to despair. It's important to look at this thing in the long term. It's important to understand that you cannot uh, hold an entire people down by force. Um, you can destroy it. I mean, it can be physically destroyed. You have had societies and countries that have been physically destroyed. You've had cities that have been physically destroyed. Six million people were destroyed by the Nazis in World War II, Jews. Many millions of others were destroyed. You can do that. But if you don't go to that level, you cannot, by force, achieve what the United States and Israel are trying to do. That's the first thing we should always remember. The second thing we should remember is that the strength of the Palestinians, if you look at the past 100, and 100 or so years, has not been their political institutions, has not been their political parties, has not been uh, the various movements or leaders who have mainly badly represented them. It's been the, the intrinsic strength of Palestinian society. It's been what you might call civil society. It's been villages, families, associations, unions, organizations at the sub-national level, some of which are national in scope. That, is, that and the kind of solidarity, which means that there are tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in remittances going back that keep people alive from Palestinians all over the world that keeps the society afloat. It is not the appalling leadership that they've had for the last generation or so. I promise you that. If it was up to the Palestinian leadership, or if we were depending on Palestinian leadership, the Palestinians would have been destroyed and defeated long ago, in the 30s or the 40s, or uh, uh, in the last five or six or seven or eight years. So there is a deep, intrinsic strength in this society, which is, is, is resists and remains steadfast and will not be budged. And that is something else you have to stick to and you have to understand. The final thing is, this is all immensely unjust. 40 years of occupation, 40 years of occupation. I was reading an article, a, a letter the other day, I can't remember where, and somebody says, the Palestinians blame the quote, occupation, unquote, for another. We can't let them get away with that. This is an occupation. Every important decision in the life of every Palestinian living in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, in Jerusalem, for the past 40 years, two full generations, has been taken by corporals and sergeants and generals of the Israeli army. Every single important decision in the lives of four million people for 40 years has been taken by the Israeli security establishment. They have absolutely no choice in an enormous range of things that we would never accept not having for ourselves. It's not just self-determination, though that, of course. It's not just having a state. It's not just being free of soldiers. It is a huge range of decisions. Can I go to the hospital? Can I go to the next village? Can I go to school? Can I send my kids to university? Can I transfer money? Can my cousin come from Amman? Every important decision in the life of every Palestinian for 40 years has been made by generals and sergeants and, and security officials of the Israeli state. Every single decision. That is unacceptable. That is unjust. And we have to hammer that home every single time we speak about it. The second thing, and I'm going back to the other part of the title of this event, is that for 60 years, people who lived perfectly peaceably in their own homes have been deprived of that right. People who have been, were made refugees in 1948, 59 years. I, I should know, I was born in 1948, it's exactly my age. Uh, 59 years and counting have been deprived of the right either to return or to obtain compensation for their property. We're Americans. Private property is the foundation of this country. Why is our property sacred and other people's property not? Why are our homes sacred and other people's homes not? 
There's nothing very hard about that for people to understand, okay? This has nothing to do with Zionism. This has nothing to do with Judaism. This has nothing to do with Arabs. This is a simple question of why, if somebody lost their property in Prague in 1938, or somebody lost their property in, in Eugene in 1961, do they still have a right to that property? And people who lost their property in 1948 or lost their homes don't have a right to it, or if not a right to it, at least to compensation for it. These are simple things. Anybody can understand these things. These are not, this is not rocket science, okay? And so th this is what I leave you with. There is an element of justice here we should never forget. There is an element of irreductibility of the Palestinians we should never, never, never forget. And finally, we should not despair. Um, this is a very bad time in Palestinian history. I mean, almost every speech I've given for the past, I don't know how many decades, begin with, <laughs> begins with, this is a very bad time for the Palestinians. This is a particularly bad time for the Palestinians. <laughs> but the points that I ended with are still valid. And I thank you very much. You've been watching a lecture by Professor Rashid Khalidi. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer segment of this program. The lecture was delivered on June 23, 2007, in Hoffman Hall on the Portland State University campus in Portland, Oregon. Rashid Khalidi is the Edward Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia University in New York. He is also director of the Middle East Institute in the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Professor Khalidi has written dozens of articles on the Palestine-Israel conflict and more broadly on U.S. policy in the Middle East. He is author of several books, including Palestinian Identity, Resurrecting Empire, Western Footprints, and America's Perilous Path in the Middle East, and most recently, The Iron Cage, the story of the Palestinian struggle for statehood. He is a contributor to the recent collection of essays, The War on Lebanon, a Reader, and served as editor for another collection, The Origins of Arab Nationalism. And now we return to the lecture by Professor Rashid Khalidi. The first question for Professor Khalidi was, if neither party, Hamas or Fatah, could get more than 20% of the vote at the present time, who would? Well, what I was saying, what I meant to say is they've really lost an enormous amount of support. The problem is these two parties have a lot of money, still have organization, and they have guns. And there's not going to be an election, unfortunately. Uh, you can be sure that they'll avoid that. So what I was trying to express with that is that, that I think both parties have really very much weakened their own support in Palestinian society by their own behavior. Um, it's a good question. I don't know who would. The problem is the, th the third force that everybody would like to you know, emerge has not got organization, money, or guns the way that Fatah and Hamas do. That's really one of the problems. Sir. The next question for Professor Khalidi was about the U.S. government's continuing to decline dialogue with Islamic states, the refusal of any kind of meaningful engagement. What is the likely reaction from Arab people in the street? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what the reaction will be, but I'll, I'll, I'll comment on what I think of, of, of the policy that you're talking about, of refusing to talk to certain countries. I'm, I'm bemused when I see that Assistant Secretary of State Christopher Hill is in North Korea. Because if you remember the original axis of evil, it included Korea. Now, evil, by my eschatology, is something you can't negotiate with. Evil, by its nature, is off there and can't be dealt with, except by good destroying it. But Assistant Secretary of State Hill is in Pyongyang, and they're going to close their reactor, by God. For, so obviously, there's evil, and there's evil. And obviously, in the blind eyes of the people who make policy in Washington, something about Iran and something about Hamas and something about Hezbollah and something, as the questioner said, about certain Islamic countries and movements is more evil than the country that actually has developed atomic weapons on these people's watch, which is to say North Korea. So I think that we should be, I think we should be, I mean, if you're going to talk about this, in, if, if, if one wants to make an issue of this, I think there's a, there's a, there's a fundamental contradiction there. Are you fundamentally anti-Muslim, one should ask them? I mean, is this what it really is about? Are you really engaged in a crusade against these evil people who have the wrong religion? I mean, what is it about North Korea that enables you to negotiate with them? Is it that they have nuclear weapons and you're scared of them? In which case, the only lesson for the Iranians is, by God, get nuclear weapons quickly. 
Now, I'm not sure that's what they intend, but that would seem to be the logic of the, uh, if there is logic, to the position of this administration. Uh, and I think it's a very serious question. I think that anybody who looks at the results of the policy of not negotiating with the, reg the Cuban regime over the last 40 odd years can see how brilliantly unsuccessful that has been. Obviously, engagement is the only way to deal with issues. Obviously. Uh, if there were an actual attack on the United States, that would be a different issue. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about potential threats to the security, maybe of somebody sometime in the future. Why can that not be talked about? I don't, I don't understand it. And I think that that should be hammered. Because, partly because there's a very important element, even in the, in the rather stolid, turgid, very unimaginative foreign policy establishment of the United States, which understands the foolishness of the current policy. I mean, go back and look at the Baker report. These are not people who are radicals. Hamilton and Baker are as establishment as they come. And they said the same thing that you're saying and that I'm saying. So it's not like we'd be, we'd be hammering on a closed door. Mo many people in the United States actually have the sense to understand that. Sir. The next question has to do with the Gaza Strip. Not what Israel will do about Gaza, but what will Egypt do about Gaza? Hmm. Well, Egypt has a problem. The question was, wh what is Egypt going to do about Gaza? Um, Egypt has a problem. Um, the Gaza Strip is immediately adjacent to Egypt. The Hamas movement is an offshoot, a branch, related to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the, the major, at the moment, the major opposition party to the regime. Um, and Egypt has spent an enormous amount of energy trying to broker arrangements that have completely collapsed uh, between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, I don't know what the Egyptians are going to do. Uh, they are about to host Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, in a summit with Ehud Olmert and King Abdullah, I believe on Monday or what's today? What's today? Saturday. 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 Okay, I have no idea where I am or what day it is. <laughs> I'm in Portland and it's Saturday. Um, on Monday, I believe it is, uh, President Mubarak at his famous, at his favorite summer resort of Sharm el-Sheikh will be, will be hosting a summit. I'm not sure that's the way to go. I, I, would, I would hope that the Egyptians and the Saudis and other Arab countries uh, act responsibly for a change, and the Jordanians, and try and reestablish something uh, uh, of the, 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 the uh, accord within Palestinian politics, which is an essential precondition. You cannot destroy Hamas. Hamas has a, a core base of support, it always did in the 15 to 25% range. It has, it has very much stronger support in the Gaza Strip. Now, I've argued they've lost much of their support. What they've lost is the people who really weren't their core support. But most of their core support is still there. You can't destroy that movement any more than you can destroy Fatah. And to, try, and to, say, and to, and to suggest doing so is, is, is incredibly foolish, or means you really want to destroy the Palestinian national movement, which I think is what many of the people in the White House really wanted to do. Uh, to the extent to which Arab governments lend themselves to that policy, they are making a grave mistake, in my view. Yes. Thank you. Um, do you think that um, by exposing, do you think a worldwide exposure of the U.S. government's role in the September 11th events could f ca cause a reduction in this uh, demonizing of Arabs and Muslim people that we've seen since 2001? I think I know what you're talking about. My, my son keeps giving me books on this subject. Um, I, I read them. I'm not convinced, to tell you the honest truth. Um, I, I think the administration exploited the events of, of September 11th shamelessly. I think that it was grist to their mill. I think that there was a level of incompetence and slovenliness and, and blindness that's quite extraordinary in Washington. I don't think that the administration concocted the events of September 11th. So I don't think that beating that drum is going to get us anywhere. But I, you know, who knows? I'm not, I'm not convinced by it. I've, I've had arguments with my son on this for a long time. Yes? Uh, you said in your talk that um, the United States and Israel would not be able to achieve what they're trying to achieve through violence unless right. they are somehow able to destroy the Palestinian people, and that's, right. not, and that's not possible. Right. So could you comment a bit more as to what you think currently our government is trying to achieve over there? You mentioned destruction of the Palestinian nationalist movement in yeah. responding to the earlier questioner, but could you say right. more about your yeah. own ideas of what we're trying to do? 
what the administration is doing in the Middle East as a whole is fighting a sort of holy cold war against Iran, what they see as extreme, a, a terrorism and an extremism. Um, I'm writing a book on the, on the Cold War, the, the real Cold War, the American-Soviet Cold War in the Middle East, and I'm struck, I'll be talking about this tonight actually, I'm struck by the parallels between the sort of Manichaean vision of the other, which drove Washington from 1945 until 1991, and the way in which that same blind, foolish uh, reductionism uh, is driving this administration. They see every single manifestation of opposition to their policy or to their stooges all over the Middle East as part of a vast conspiracy. They see it's all connected. They have not got the discrimination or the knowledge to understand that uh, Hezbollah does not equal Hamas, does not equal Syria, does not equal Iran, does not equal Al-Qaeda, does not equal Saddam. They actually believe, many of them, or believed in that set of connections, every single one of which is false. I mean, there are connections between some of those things that I mentioned, but that this equals this equals this, which is really basically the way they see things, is fundamentally false. So what they're doing is fighting what they see as a single war. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cold war. It's a covert war. It's a war carried out by getting people to blow other people up or getting people to assassinate people. Or, you know, it's not done directly, except in Iraq and in Afghanistan, where we actually have soldiers fighting. We're not directly engaged in a hot war which is two big exceptions, obviously. Um, and in both of those places, it's more complicated even than I'm talking about. But throughout the region, what the United States is doing is engaged in what, it, what this administration is doing, is engaging in what it sees as a vast campaign against a single conspiracy, terrorist extremist conspiracy. Uh, this, is, this is based on a fundamental misreading of every single situation, whether Lebanon or Palestine. Uh, and in the specific case of Palestine, what they're trying to do is, I think, in, in my view, is to get Palestinians to destroy one another, such that Hamas is destroyed by Fatah, uh, uh, and get Fatah and, and, and the Palestinian Authority to accept whatever arrangement the Israelis want to impose, or not impose. And given that Israeli policy for the last six or seven years and more, really, has, not been to has been to not negotiate, not propose a solution, not deal with anything, that's what the administration wants. On this issue, I don't think they have their own policy. The most important man in Washington, as far as the Middle East is concerned, is a gentleman by the name of Elliot Abrams. Now, if you think that Elliot Abrams, who was indicted and convicted of a felony of lying to Congress back in Iran-Contra days, is trying to sow democracy in the Middle East, you need to have your head examined. These people are not Democrats. Negroponte is not a Democrat. Poindexter is not a Democrat. And Elliot Abrams is not a Democrat. They've subverted our democratic process. They are convicted felons in some cases. And the felony they convicted is a felony against democracy. When you lie to Congress and subvert the intent of Congress as a paid official of the United States government, you have certified that you can never use the word democracy. So this administration claiming that it's trying to spread democracy is like a bunch of pyromaniacs saying that they're the fire brigade. It's absolutely absurd. It has nothing to do with democracy. It has nothing to do with anything but the campaign I talked about. What is your opinion, and what do you think is most uh, the opinion of most Palestinians uh, concerning the practicality of a one-state solution versus a two-state solution? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to tell you what the view of most Palestinians is. I have no idea what the view of most Palestinians is. Um, and this is a subject I actually, I, I'm not trying to flog my own book, but uh, I, I actually think you ought to read the account in the last chapter where I talk about this issue of state, uh, state or several states. And I, I actually think that the main thing the Palestinians have to worry about rather than one state or two states is how they get out of the state that they're in right now, <laughs> okay? So, you know, I, I really think that talking about where we would get to if there were a unified Palestinian national movement which was able to effectively act such that it could change the situation in Israel and the United States such that we could get anywhere from where we are is so far in the future that I actually think it's a little bit destructive to waste a huge amount of energy dealing with it. I think that we are right now facing a one-state solution, but it's not the one-state solution that Palestinian advocates of a one-state solution talk about. It is an Israeli state solution where you have a form of uh, full citizenship for Israelis with discrimination between Arabs and Israel and, and, and Israeli Jews, and helot status, non-citizen, non-right st status for the four, four million people who live under occupation. 
That's the state we've got, and that's the state we're going to have. In the, in the sense of that is the status quo, and it, it project it, and that uh, unless something changes it, that projects into the future. And that's obviously an unstable state. That is not a state that can last. You cannot have that kind of worse than apartheid situation with Bantustans in the West Bank and an open air prison camp in the Gaza Strip forever. It necessarily, inevitably, will explode one way or another. It will break down one way or another. But that is the, what we've got. Now, how we get from that to somewhere else is what I'd like to have somebody who wants to talk about the future talk about. Not, you know, we should have this kind of one state, or no, we should have two states. I, we're nowhere near a negotiation for two states. And getting most Palestinians who, until recently, wanted a state of their own, and most Israelis who still want a state of their own, to accept one state is a, is a Herculean task. So I actually think that it's a little bit like decide, you know, trying to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pin to discuss one state or two states. I mean, each of them, to my way of thinking, has grave disadvantages. And each of them has you know, partisans. So I, 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 I read what I say in my book if you want you know, more, more detail than that. I understand your reference to the felons in government today, yeah. in the administration. I think you need to go, and perhaps you have, a step further in quoting f the former US congressman from Illinois, Paul Findlay, mm. who says they are bribed felons. He has been through that experience in terms of Israel and its APAC lobbies, type lobbies, bribing and holding hostage our government, which would explain to a degree our government's stance in behalf of Palestine, I mean of uh, Israel. My question for you is, what is it that has convinced the American people, the American people, to fundamentally be supportive of Israel. I think in terms of one name to illustrate it, Mortimer Zuckerman, who is the publisher of US News and World Report. Others like him, I'm asking you, have Israelis increasingly gotten control of the mass media and so that we're being convinced of their point of view? Or is it simply that our mass media is completely out of it and doesn't understand? I, I don't think the, the question is, is about the mass media. I think the question has to be, if you're a politician, what's in it for you in opposing Israel? OK? And the mass media is part of it. But where is a body of voters in the hundreds of thousands or millions whose vote will depend on somebody not voting in favor of Israel and voting in favor of Palestine. Now, there is a block of voters, people who will give millions, tens of millions of dollars, and will deliver district after district. And when I say deliver, I mean deliver. Really, their votes are there on the other side of the issue. There is simply nothing on our side of the issue in terms of political weight in this country. I'm really sorry for people who believe that there's a great conspiracy. There's no conspiracy. There's votes, and there's money, and there's organization. And on the other side, there are no votes, and there's no organization, and there's no money. It's a no-brainer. I mean, a politician would be a moron to put her or her, his head into the meat grinder of opposing people who have money, organization, and votes. Whereas, whereas on the other side, there, is none of, there are none of those things. I mean, this does not require conspiracy theory. And it's what you say about the press. I mean, God knows, I live in New York City. I have the New York Daily News. I have the New York Post. And I have the New York Sun, which is the worst of the lot. Not to speak of the New York Times. And that's what people read in New York City. So I know about the media. I deal with it all the time. But that is not the core of the problem. The core of the problem is the politicians who are not just worried about what the media will say. They're worried about the fact that People like us don't have a block of votes. People like us cannot deliver the checks that they need to, 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 to run the disgusting machine that is an American political campaign. And people like us don't have organization. So when and if we had those things and then there were still some sinister, tenebrous conspiracy preventing, then you might, you might in fact, we might find that yeah, that's not enough. But I think in the absence of all of those things, which seem to me to be the obvious answer, um, we shouldn't really need to look very much further. Uh, there will be a day, not very soon perhaps, it'll maybe take a, a half a generation, when you will have as many Arab Americans and as many Muslim Americans in journalism schools and in law schools and in, and in uh, uh, medical schools and so on and so forth as you have Jewish Americans. But that's not going to happen uh, today and tomorrow. 
And until that happens, you have a very large body of people, many of whom I, I sadly have to say are, are dis, uh, misled about Israel and Palestine, who feel very strongly about this issue. They're single issue voters. They don't care about anything else, some of them. This is the thing which will make or break their vote. You vote against this issue, that's, uh, the, and I will vote against you. You don't take the right position, and I will vote against you. We need a, a similar number of people who feel just as strongly and make their voices heard just as loudly, and the checks to go with it, and the organization to go with it, and, 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 and politicians who can be as bare knuckled as the kind of people that Finley talks about, and the kind of operatives who can be as bare knuckled as the kind of people that McCloskey went up against, or Percy went up against. I mean, there are a half dozen American politicians who've been chopped down uh, by this machine. Uh, until and unless we have those things, I don't think we, we really should be talking about APAC or whatever. What you've got to do is, is play the game. You don't have to play it the way they play it. You don't have to play it dirty, but you have to play that game one way or another, or you can't talk about it. I mean, we don't have the right to talk about it unless and until there is that, that kind of level. Uh, yes, sir. Let's have a couple of women. I mean, every single questioner is a male. I, I agree with you. Uh, when you have all the power, you don't need a conspiracy. You know, it's like the... Uh, St. Louis Rams against Bucolic Valley High School. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm a psychologist, and when I think about the one state, two state, you know, what I see in Palestine is a state of depression. Yeah. I mean, you're defining, you're describing, as everyone else has, you know, the, the basic conditions of depression, which are hopelessness and helplessness. And anytime you have a colonialized uh, population like this, you see the same thing. You see this fratricidal kind of thing like you see with Hamas and uh, Fatah. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to imagine what France would have been like if Normandy had failed and we still had, you know, Vichy against La Résistance for 40 years. So I, I don't see any solution except rescue. I mean, uh, I don't think uh, Palestine has, has the power, the will. Uh, they can't do it on their own. Yeah. Uh, they need a rescuer to come in. And uh, do you see any uh, on the horizon? Well, let me, let me say something about uh, situations, colonial situations and situations of occupation. What you say about depression is true, but there is something else in those situations, which is resistance. And that is there now in various forms, and it's been true in every colonial situation. I mean, Palestine is not unique in, in that respect. Uh, it has a unique aspect. Every colonial situation does. Every situation of occupation does. But um, in those situations, just as there is depression, and just as there is uh, fratricidal in, internecine conflict in some cases triggered by the colonizer, there is always, always, inevitably, in various forms, resistance. Um, there was in Algeria, there is in Palestine, there, was, there is in every situation of occupation. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't picture it entirely as, as, as gloomily as you do. And for the last question. Um, I'm asking about the Council of National Interest, CNI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that possible to um, be a counterforce to APAC? You know, I, I don't know that much about the Council of National Interest. I get some of their literature. I know some of the people. I, I, I sort of made a decision a, a little while ago, which was I can do a couple of things at, reasonably adequately. And one of the things I really can't do reasonably adequately, together with writing and teaching and speaking, I mean, I, I do about 50 or 60 things like this, or 80 or 100 a year. And I try and write, and I try and publish, and I actually teach. I have a day job. I actually have students who, you know, completely <laughs> dependent on me for their grades and all of that. And that's where my salary comes from. I can't do all of those things and be involved in politics, okay? I mean, I'm a political being. I'm interested in politics. I'm a political analyst and so on. But, you know, I, I, I was once involved with a group in Washington. I, I, I stopped dealing with them because I figured I can't spend the kind of time I need to spend to be sure that they do what I want them to do, or if I disagree with them, I can fight it out with them, and at the same time, speak and write and teach and, you know, whatever. So I just don't, you know, I, I, I can't do it. I can't really honestly answer your question. I don't know where that thing is going to come from, and whether that's the core of it or something else is the core of it, or uh, because I, that's something I just decided, you know, there are some things you can't do. I, I decided I couldn't play baseball at a certain stage much, 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 much before this one. <laughs> Um, and a few other things. But what can we do then? I, I, I'm not here to tell you that. I'm not here to tell you that. That's for you guys to decide. I am really not here to tell you that. I've told you what some of the things I need, I think, you know, 
how you might help, might, things that might help you to understand the situation. But what you should do, I don't know what you should do. <laughs> You've been listening to a lecture by Professor Rashid Khalidi. This lecture was delivered on June 23, 2007, in Hoffman Hall on the Portland State University campus in Portland, Oregon. If you'd like to find out more about this lecture and the topics discussed, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. Thank you for watching, and thank you for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access television, net neutrality, and all forms of democratic community media.